In the year 428, a man named Nestorius came to Constantinople as the new archbishop of the imperial capital. He had studied under the great theologian Theodore of Mopsuestia in Antioch and was determined to be diligent in refuting all strange doctrines and stamping out heresy. In a sermon during Advent or Christmas at his cathedral, he preached a sermon in which he pointed out that our choice of terms for Mary is very important theologically. He asserted that you shouldn't call her Theotokos, which means God-bearer or mother of God, as people commonly do. Instead, he said you should call her Christotokos, the Christ-bearer. Well, the congregation was taken aback. According to legend, one brave layman even stood up and shouted a rebuke of the bishop. Everyone, of course, agreed that Mary was Jesus' mother. So what did Nestorius really mean? This was not so much about Mary as it was about Jesus. Is Jesus not God? Was he not divine from the beginning? Is he half man and half God rather than fully both? Were there two persons we call Jesus, one human, one divine? This controversy over language had revealed a much deeper theological dispute. The true doctrines and heretical teachings about the person of Jesus would be sorted out over the next few centuries. The next ecumenical council at Ephesus in 431 would deal with Nestorianism directly and condemn his teachings. And the next three councils would continue to deal with the fallout over the issues raised about the person of Christ. This spring, the Anglican Church in North America College of Bishops issued a teaching encyclical pushing back against the culture of today which pushes sexual identity and the concept of sexual minorities. And they responded by saying that we ought not to use the term gay Christian as a label because as people of faith we primarily find our identity in Christ, not in our temptations. We should instead describe such believers as Christians who experience same-sex attraction. Some have objected to this, most dramatically in an open letter authored by a layman named Peter Valk, titled Dear Gay Anglicans. The discussion of this objection has uncovered fundamental theological issues. As with the Nestorian controversy, here again, a controversy over language has revealed a much deeper theological dispute over the nature of sin and, and temptation, the fall, original sin, and the meaning of concupiscence. Well, welcome to the Rector's Report. I'm the Rector, Father Timothy Matkin from St. Francis Anglican Church in Dallas. Glad you joined us for this report. I want to fill you in on this controversy here, which is, as I said, not so much about this label of gay, but rather all of the theological issues that are more fundamental that have been uncovered by the controversy. On the Ad Orientum blog, Father Jonah succinctly summarized the situation. Quote, the ACNA is in a considerable controversy over identity and sexuality, which has now become an international issue. At issue is a statement by the College of Bishops was, which was contradicted later by Bishop Todd Hunter in a pastoral guidance letter to the Diocese of Churches for the Sake of Others. Not long after that, an ACNA aspirant to Holy Orders, with the signatory support of major figures at Trinity School for Ministry and the editor of Anglican Compass, issued a letter challenging the College of Bishops' instruction. The remainder is the fallout from it, which elevated the matter from an internal impasse to an international row. More, most significantly, Nigeria rebuking the ACNA. Now, Nigeria had the mistaken idea that ACNA had caved on this issue of sexual moral morality. Since then, the Church of Nigeria and the Anglican Church in North America have patched up the misunderstanding with a common statement from the respective archbishops. I put all these links that Father Jonah references on his blog to the documents regarding the controversy in the description below. I encourage you to go down there and check it out for further reading. 
And before we get into that controversy, let us take a step back for a moment to gather a view of the wider context. The breakdown of the Episcopal Church in the United States created resistance and then fracturing among parties. In the new climate of contested Anglican identity, the status and content of one of the Anglican formularies, the Articles of Religion, has gained renewed attention. Leading into the breakup of the Episcopal Church because of the controversy and fallout from the election of Gene Robinson as Bishop of New Hampshire in 2003, there's been a revival of evangelicalism of a somewhat fundamentalist stripe. The most visible arm of that has been the Stand Firm website, which was originally more of a news and commentary aggregate, but has recently been rebooted as more of an evangelical think tank. These evangelicals are explicitly Calvinist and see the 39 Articles as a kind of Anglican confessional document, akin to the Augsburg Confession for the Lutherans or the Westminster Confession for the Presbyterians. The Articles, of course, are articles of peace designed to put controversies to a rest and pacify different theological groups in the Church of England. They were designed to shut people up, I guess. Obviously, they were not acceptable to the more militant Calvinists, as demonstrated in their ultimate response, civil war, the execution of the king and the archbishop, the overthrow of the Church of England, and the crafting of the Westminster Confession to replace the Articles of Religion, which the militant Calvinists found unacceptable. One illustration of the kind of upside-down approach these current evangelicals have to the Articles is demonstrated in the response of Father Matt Kennedy to the proposed deletion of the Filioque from the Nicene Creed in the Common Prayer draft texts. Whereas the deletion was made to return to the original form of the Creed as adopted and promulgated by the First Council of Constantinople. And this was following up on the urging of the Lambeth Conference to do so in future re revisions of the prayer book throughout the Anglican Communion. Kennedy opposed this because the filioque is affirmed in the Articles. That is, the hierarchy of authority in spiritual matters is inverted in this new Calvinist evangelical Anglican perspective. With local synods, at least if they happen to be English convocations in 1563, taking precedence over universal synods. Adherence to the Articles was made a legal requirement by the English Parliament in 1571. For a more balanced approach, let's turn to what has sometimes been referred to as the Anglican Summa, the volume of dogmatic theology, uh, multi-volume dogmatic theology of Father Francis Hall, who was a professor at General Seminary. Uh, <laughs> Seminary. In Volume 2, in Chapter 5, uh, Part 2, he has a section on provincial authority. And these are the things that he points out. Provincial councils are, as far as their name indicates, representative of limited parts of the church. And then a few pages later, he continues, provincial formularies are binding upon the faithful in those portions of the church which adopt and impose them, but always on the assumption that they do not conflict with the teaching of the universal church. In a 2014 lecture at the Shrine of Walsingham, the English historian Dr. Colin Podmore noted, quote, because the Church of England claims to be part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, her formularies need to be interpreted, not in isolation, but in the light of what the Church has believed through the ages, and in particular what was taught by the Fathers and Councils of the early Church. That is expressed in Canon A5, which affirms that the doctrine of the Church of England is grounded in the Holy Scriptures and in such teachings of the ancient Fathers and Councils of the Church 
as are agreeable to the said scriptures. It then adds, In particular, such doctrine is to be found in the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the Ordinal. That means that we interpret the historic formularies in the light of the teachings of the Fathers and the Councils, not the other way around. Likewise, when we interpret later or local synods, as with the Articles passed by the English Convocation of Canterbury and York and ratified by Parliament, the interpretive lens must be the hermeneutic of continuity. There is no legitimate alternative. Our only obligation is to the faith once delivered to the saints. As John Henry Newman put it in regard to the Articles at the end of Tract 90, it is a duty which we owe both to the Catholic Church and to our own to take our Reformed confessions in the most Catholic sense they will admit. We have no duties toward their framers. As we mentioned before, the ACNA has been embroiled in some controversy over identity and sexuality, which has even become an international issue. At issue is a unanimous teaching encyclical by the College of Bishops. You can find the link down below. In an attempt to push back against the culture, it argued that using the label gay is unhelpful. And I would add that they are exactly right about this. Those who control the language, control the conversation and the narrative. And in fact, we do not believe in the concept of sexual minorities. Human beings are sexual. The prefix is really unnecessary. All of us are tempted to naughty things. But that's not where we should find our identity. Sexuality is not a culture, and we should resist the attempt to try to make it one. Saying you're gay is not like saying you're Irish or a Southerner. The reason behind avoiding this terminology of gay Christian as a label is that Christians should not primarily find our identity in our problems or our temptations, but rather we primarily find our identity in our relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives. And to put the matter in perspective, I would note that no one seems to be using the term chaste Christians. Also, the label gay tends to imply acting on temptations to unnatural vice. As a comparison, if I described myself as a natural-born killer, you would assume that I had, in fact, killed someone. Not that I was striving for holiness and resisting the impulse to commit murder. If we need to discuss the moral issue of Christians who often identify as gay, the bishops advise that we ought instead to describe such people as Christians who experience same-sex attraction. In the conclusion, the statement invited local engagement. It stated, quote, Upholding our commitment to subsidiarity, we defer to diocesan bishops to discern these matters within their own diocesan communities and ministries. Some of the content was, some would say, contradicted later by Bishop Todd Hunter in a pastoral guidance letter to the Diocese of C4SO, basically what amounted to kind of a minority report, emphasizing compassion to Christians and others who struggle with same-sex attraction. Not long after that, an aspirant discerning holy orders in the ACNA Diocese of Pittsburgh, although he lives in Nashville, with the signatory support of major figures at Trinity School for Ministry and the editor of Anglican Compass, issued a letter engaging the College of Bishops' instruction titled Dear Gay Anglicans and pushing back on the direction to avoid the term gay. The author and aspirant is named Peter Valk, a licensed professional counselor and director of an organization called Equip, an organization which describes its mission, quote, is being to help churches become places where LGBT plus Christians could belong and thrive according to a traditional sexual ethic. He is also the founder of a 
small sort of semi-monastic community. And I'm not sure, uh, but it seems like um, the members of the community are also um, people who struggle with same-sex attraction but are committed to a traditional sexual ethic. In his position paper, Why Say Gay?, Volk describes himself in this way, quote, I am a Christian. I am gay. I believe that God's best for every Christian, including me, is a lifetime vocation of celibate singleness, that means the same, for the sake of the kingdom, or a lifetime vocation of marriage between one man and one woman to raise children. I have accepted God's call to vocational singleness. Needless to say, at least naming the letter Dear Gay Anglicans in response to a teaching document instructing us not to use the label gay did not sit well with the College of Bishops. Although the content of the open letter was fairly mild, the title was highly legalistic, Jesuitical. Consider the maneuver. If I can't say gay Christian, well, how about gay Anglican? Well, he was instructed by his bishop to take down the letter, and he complied. But of course, this is the internet, so it's out there. One of the things we ought to consider is some of the background in what we call the revoice and spiritual friendship movements. Revoice is more of the organization, and in fact the website revoice.us um, describes itself this way. Revoice exists to support and encourage Christians who are sexual minorities so they can flourish in historic Christian traditions. In other words, this is not just an Anglican outfit. Rejo Revoice exists because we want to see gay or same-sex attracted people who adhere to historic Christian teaching about marriage and sexuality experience peace and belonging in their local faith communities. We envision a unified, faithful, and peaceful church where these individuals are able to grow in holiness and in their knowledge of the scriptures, knowing that they are of infinite worth and value to their Creator, where transparency about one's orientation and ongoing experience creates enhanced possibilities for local churches to utilize and celebrate the unique opportunities that these individuals have to serve the Kingdom of God and where these individuals are welcomed into the lives of spiritual families so that all can grow together in their knowledge of God and His Kingdom. As far as spiritual friendship, I turned in this case to uh, an article from a blog titled Mere Orthodoxy, A Critical View of Spiritual Friendship by Stephen Wedgworth. And I turned there because I think he sums it up well. What is spiritual friendship, he writes? While the name itself would merely suggest the classical notion of the love of friendship, or philia, ordered toward God, in the context of LGBT Christianity, spiritual friendship now means more than that. It involves a set of ideas and assertions, all of which have some relationship to homoerotic feelings. Among these are the following. Number one, that while sexual activity between persons of the same sex is indeed sinful, the complex set of desires and psychological orientations which would otherwise lead to those actions are not sinful. Number two, in fact, these are potentially good, as they are, at some basic point, a longing toward a true good. Because of this, number three, a gay identity can and should constitute something around which a community can be formed, so long as its members remain celibates, that is, chaste. Number four, the church should recognize and welcome these communities, noting how it has actually harmed persons with same-sex attraction in the past, both by being malicious toward them, but also by not properly recognizing them. And number five, there's a difference between the fulfillment promised by romantic love and the physical acts attached to it, the former of which can be approximated, if not entirely realized, through close friendship. Thus, one way in which these sorts of gay Christians can avoid the loneliness 
which would otherwise come from renouncing their erotic desires, is by forming close and even vowed or covenanted friendships with other Christians of the same sex. And number six, the renunciation of the sexual act can enable the gay Christian to live a particularly religious celibate life analogous to the counsels of perfection as they sublimate the sexual desire toward a more perfect form of love. And Wedgworth goes on to say the most basic problem anyone addressing the concept of gay Christianity will encounter is the status of concupiscence. Augustine, I believe rightly, maintained that concupiscence was itself sinful. I would diverge and say that's not entirely accurate, but he certainly does lead in that way at some points, and there is an argument over exactly what he means. While the later medieval tradition largely disagreed, and that is the case, the Protestant reformers returned to the Augustinian notion of concupiscence, whereas the Roman Catholic response was to double down in its opposition to this position. This explains, at least in part, why spiritual friendship writers like Ron Dalgau have had trouble being understood when they speak of the sinfulness of sexual temptation. Belgal does not only argue that temptation in the abstract need not always be sinful. He argues that particular temptations, namely sexual desires, can be, quote, not morally neutral, but also not sinful. And by the way, Wedgworth goes on to argue that the central flaw in the spiritual friendship movement, and you can hear how it pulls from the monastic writings of St. Elrad, how the flaw is that it's a conflation of eros and philia. The movement is redeemable, he argues, if the transition from one to another is explicit. If not, the propensity to slide from philia back to eros is real when you don't recognize the difference between the two. Well, now I want to turn to the meat of the matter. We mentioned how this controversy over language uncovered a deeper theological issue. Well, I became aware of this in listening to a Stand Firm podcast, episode number 40. Now, the Stand Firm podcast is hosted by three ACNA priests, Nick Lannon, Matthew Kennedy, and J.D. Koch. And one of the things that Kennedy mentioned was I don't agree, this is a quote, I don't agree that those who want to identify as gay Christian or gay Anglican are committed to a traditional sexual ethic. And I think going over some of that material from Revoice and from the spiritual friendship movement and Equip and so on, that worry does strike me as well. I remain kind of unconvinced. But this is not just about Peter Valk's letter but the revoice and spiritual friendship movements in general. Kennedy's not convinced. It seems more about embracing temptations or disorders as much as possible without crossing the line of finding something valuable within the disordered affections, which not enacting unnatural vice could be useful or beneficial or even regarded as spiritually uplifting. To work from stereotypes, it would be, we might say, to embrace one's gayness in order to take advantage of uh, all the stereotypical things associated with that, Art artistic skills or the gift of gab or a fashion sense or a flair for entertaining or hospitality, while not giving in to the sexual temptation to unnatural vice. Kennedy's interest in, of course, Reformed theology has him further engaged in this before other Anglicans because this has already become an issue in PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America, with the introduction of uh, Revoice and so on in that context. Now I'm going to play the audio clip from the podcast. It falls right about in the middle of the program. It's nearly six minutes long, but it is really worth hearing in full context and I ask you to uh, follow along, and then we'll talk about it afterward. I'm going to 
touch on this point really interesting. It's the next point that he makes in this note because I think it's really important. I did not know how to weigh this is Peter Peter Valk is writing writing this. I did not know how to weigh the potential impact of the letter on gay people in Africa against the pain gay Christians committed to a traditional sexual ethic in North America would feel if the letter was taken down. Okay, so two things here. First of all, he's portraying this as if he was he was having this kind of conscientious problem uh, before uh, his bishop asked him to take it down, before the, the uproar, he was just wrestling with his own conscience. I'm, again, I, that, I'll, I'll let that be between him and God, um, but I, I'm not confident given his past performance in that profession. But secondly, okay, I don't agree that those who want to identify as gay Christian or gay Anglican are committed to a traditional sexual ethic. They might be committed to part of it, and that the part of it being the celibate part, but that's not all that was involved in the traditional sexual eth ethic. All that was involved in the traditional sexual, sexual ethic is it, it included identifying those predispositions, those orientations, those that we used the word last time, that, that concupiscence that cuts against the natural order and confessing that as sin and not identifying with it, recognizing that that's something that is, is, is to be pushed away from and prayed against rather than something to identify with. That's the traditional sexual ethic. So I don't, I don't buy the, the idea that those who are, who are within maybe the revoice movement within the Presbyterian or reform world, or those in the, uh, the spiritual friendship movement are embracing this, the traditional Christian sexual ethic. They're embracing well, see, this, is, this is, but this is the yeah. big point of confusion. And we've talked about this before, but it bears repeating because I, I downloaded his uh, why say gay pamphlet and read it. And, and I thought, you know, it, it was fairly, um, standard stuff as we've come to read from the kind of spiritual friendship and revoice people but this was to this point very interesting in some of the question and answer thing he says isn't merely experiencing same-sex attraction sin itself question mark should that be reason enough not to call yourself gay he asks and this is what he says if you not already read the discussion at the end of this document and my definition of the phrase same-sex attraction and question the sinfulness and concupiscence please take time to do so thankfully the anglican church in north america along with the oldest christian traditions that respect a majority of christians both the United States and globally do not teach that Christians sin merely by being tempted. When I experience same-sex attractions yet resist these temptations, I am not guilty of sin. That's not true. Yeah. That's not true. That's neither Anglican nor biblical nor right. true. And so the right. fact that the the fact that the Catholic Church affirms that is is in fact true. And there is a warm and welcome embrace for people who want to hold that uh, one imagines. Uh, it was literally the fight at the time of the Reformation. It remains the most offensive aspect of what we call original sin. And yet, as Luther rightly saw, was the heart, the beating heart of the gospel, because we do not confess the sins of what we do. We confess the dispositions of our fallen nature. And the disposition of our fallen nature produces all acts of of unrighteousness, but as Jesus himself said, the seat of our evil is not in what we do, but in the reality of who we are. And if yeah. we deny that, well, then we can certainly call ourselves all whatever the heck we want, as long as we don't do any of the things. Um, we can be possessed by and roiled by all manner of um, desires and temptations within, which is what we would have done until Jesus himself clarified and closed that loophole by saying, you've heard it said, you shall, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, if you even think of a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery with her heart. And then the apostle Paul in the incredible theological reflection on in part what Jesus had said in Romans chapter seven begins to expound on the fact that the law itself provoked the sin. And in particular, the 10th commandment being thou shalt not covet because that was the one that encompassed everything because to covet means that you should be God because he somehow made a mistake. And so this was the statement that Jesus said that has been understood ever since the time of the Reformation, which is when the Bible was given back to the church. And to deny that is to deny, well, the Anglican understanding of the gospel, if we even need to say that. But of course, the, the, the biblical proclamation of our, of our need and our redemption. And that's what we're fighting against. It's not these particular people. I mean, we're pastors, for goodness sakes. Like we welcome, you know, uh, all ye sinners, poor and lonely, weak and wounded by the fall is the hymn says this is what we're welcoming but we refuse to let someone persist in um, defining themselves by what the the very thing for which jesus died 
That's whereby, what yeah, whereby the lust of the flesh, called in Greek, uh, for an amos, for an amos sarcos, that's right. The, the, which that's some right. do expound the wisdom, some sensuality, some the affection, some the desire right. of the flesh is not subject to the law of God. And yet, although there is no condemnation for them that believed and are baptized, yet the apostle doth confess that concupiscence and lust right. hath in <laughs> of itself the nature of sin. That's the Anglican position. That's yeah. from the 39 articles, in case you didn't know Which what that was Which happens to calling. be, is not a historical document in the ACNA, is in fact a legitimate form, one of our formularies, and is something to which aspirants alike and, and priests alike are beholden. Now, some of the things to really pay attention to in that podcast was when J.D. Koch, quoting from Peter Valk, um, who says Anglicans and, and so on do not teach that Christians sin merely by being tempted. When I experience same-sex attraction, yet resist these temptations, I am not guilty of sin. And Koch responds, that's not true. That's neither Anglican nor biblical nor true. So by contrast, Koch is saying that the Lutheran, Calvinist, Protestant tradition teaches that Christians do sin merely by being tempted, even if they refuse that temptation. So you see how wrong-headed this theology is. He says, unbelievable, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He says, we do not confess the sins of what we do. We confess the, dispos the dispositions of our fallen nature. That is, we don't confess our sins, we just confess that we're sinners almost as if we must repent of our fallen human nature, not of our transgressions. Koch claims that in the Sermon on the Mount, quote, as Jesus himself said, the seat of our evil is not in what we do, but in the reality of who we are. Of course, Jesus did not mean this, and certainly did not say this. He talked about getting to the root of the problem, as with adultery and murder rather than focusing on how close to the line I can get without crossing it. You've heard it was said, don't commit murder. But I say, if you're angry with your brother, you know, you've already gone too far. You've heard it was said, don't commit adultery. But I say, if you even lust after a woman in your mind, in your heart, you've already gone too far. Well, now we want to look at and talk about anthropology, Catholic anthropology versus Protestant anthropology. And I'm going to put on the screen a diagram which will illustrate the basic fundamental difference between the two. First, on the top, what you notice here is the Protestant anthropology. And you have on one side Eden and on heaven, uh, and on the other side heaven. And that is the natural state of man. Man was created in the garden. He falls, and he falls to the condition of total depravity. And so salvation lifts him back up to the place where he started. So he makes a full circle, returning to the state that he had in Eden. And so heaven and Eden are basically uh, pretty much the same. The Catholic anthropology is different. Here we begin in Eden, and it's not just a natural state, but a preterite natural state, that is, something that goes beyond nature. And of course, in the Garden of Eden, you have the fall. What do we fall to? Unlike the Catholic, or unlike the Protestant model, we don't fall to total depravity. What we fall to is our unaided condition, the natural state that we exist in the world without God's help, without His gifts. And then in our salvation, we're not brought back up to that preternatural state of Eden, but brought far beyond that to a teleological fulfillment of our end purpose and design and creation. To live with heaven, we're brought up to a supernatural condition. To be, as St. Peter said in 2 Peter 1.4, partakers of the divine nature. And so here we see in the distinction between the two, the basic Catholic versus Protestant anthropologies. I want to turn again to Francis Hall's Dogmatic Theology. This is volume 5, 
where he addresses creation and the fall and so on. And he addresses here that Catholic concept of the natural state of man in, which we encounter in the fall. He says, man was created in such wise as to be naturally lacking in self-sufficiency and to be dependent upon supernatural assistance for ability to maintain his integrity, to fulfill righteousness, and to become worthy of his heavenly destiny. In his natural state, not designed to be left to itself, man is an unfinished product, and when deprived of the grace which is required for his development, he becomes, by reason of the power which his animal propensities acquire over his moral and spiritual ones, a self-corrupting product, quote, far gone from original righteousness. This is the natural state of every child of Adam, a state which is called concupiscence. It is also often described in terms of sin and guilt. And so this is but basically what we have in the fall and the advent of what we call original sin. Original sin is not so much a description of that first sin that was committed, which is basically the sin of pride, self-idolatry. You want to become like God yourself. But rather, it is re a reference to the condition of man in the fall. We are now outside the family of God. We are without His help, His special preternatural and supernatural gifts. So let's look for a moment in the Catholic doctrine and the Catholic anthropology. What exactly is it that we lost in the fall? Well, there are four things. One supernatural and three preternatural gifts. The supernatural gift is original righteousness, sanctifying grace, that which makes us holy and pleasing to God. God shares His goodness, His life with us, and makes us fit for heaven. Now that's something that we lost by rejecting God in the garden, but we are given it again in the sacraments of the church through the atonement of Christ who shares his merits with us. Now the three preternatural gifts we don't get until the full restoration in heaven. Those are first immortality, hence in our fallen condition we are mortal. The next is infused knowledge, in the Garden of Eden, nobody had to teach Adam how to do things. Nobody had to teach Adam that God was God and that he was the one who makes the rules and so on. He was given what he needed to know. We've all seen instinct in our pets and even in our children. You notice you don't need to teach them how to misbehave. And so without that infused knowledge, we are left in that fallen condition, that natural condition, which is ignorance. And number four, the last preternatural gift that we lost, is the ability to resist sin. In the garden, as we were designed and equipped with these special gifts, everything was in order. Our decision-making process was truly free, and it was sublimated to the guidance of reason. Now, without that ability to resist sin, we turn less and less to reason in judgment-making and turn more and more to our impulses and appetites that throw us off target and get us into trouble. And this is basically the meaning of concupiscence. I want to turn to Father John Harden in the Pocket Catholic Dictionary, which I use quite often, and he has a helpful definition of concupiscence, insubordination of man's desires to the dictates of reason and the propensity of human nature to sin as a result of original sin. More commonly, it refers to the spontaneous movement of the sensitive appetites toward whatever the imagination portrays as pleasant and away from whatever it portrays as painful. However, concupiscence also includes the unruly desires of the will, such as pride, ambition, and envy. And we'll notice that the word concupiscence means together thoroughly with cupere, which is desire. And in fact, an easy way to remember this and, and to uh, tell people what it means is, is con means with, and Cupid is basically, uh, you know, the little fat guy who shoots people with the arrows and makes them fall in love. Uh, that's the same origin. 
So to act with concupiscence is to uh, mean that you act with your cupid sense and you just follow your lusts wherever they lead you and, and let yourself get shot with the arrows and, and so on. Now in the Council of Trent, uh, this matter was considered and, and debated and uh, decreed in the Council of Trent that addresses the situation of the fall and original sin and concupiscence this way. Quote, In those who are born again, God hates nothing, because there is no condemnation to those who are truly buried together with Christ by baptism unto death, who walk not according to the flesh, but putting off the old man and putting on the new one, who is created according to God, are made innocent, immaculate, pure, guiltless, and beloved of God, heirs indeed of God, joint heirs with Christ, so that there is nothing whatever to hinder their entrance into heaven. But this holy council perceives and confesses that in the one baptized there remains concupiscence or an inclination to sin, which, since it is left for us to wrestle with, cannot injure those who do not acquiesce, but resist manfully by the grace of Christ. Indeed, he who shall have striven lawfully shall be crowned. This concupiscence, which the Apostle sometimes calls sin, the Holy Council declares the Catholic Church has never understood to be called sin in the sense that it is truly and properly sin in those born again, but in the sense that it is of sin and inclines to sin. But if anyone is of the contrary position, let him be anathema. Now we're going to turn from the Catholic position back to the Protestant Calvinist and Lutheran position with a summary of exactly what is Calvinism. We brought that into discussion before. Now Luther was not a systematic theologian, and in fact he wrote a whole lot of stuff, but it's sometimes difficult to put it all together. You could have a whole series of uh, programs called Luther Against Luther, where you pit his own writings against himself, because he's not always consistent. But Calvin is a systematic thinker, and he put together a whole system which basically came to dominate in Protestant theology. And let me read this excerpt from Hall, who puts together uh, what Calvinism really is on page 305 of volume 5. And he notes in the beginning, in justice to many of those who cherish the memory of John Calvin, it should be borne in mind that not all the views that are called Calvinist are today accepted by such Calvinists in general. Like all influential systems, Calvinism has been caricatured and is both supported and attacked in forms that Calvinists would generally disown. Moreover, the system has, so to speak, sloughed off some of the 16th century elements, and its confessional articles are now given a less rigid interpretation by its supporters. So this is Calvinism. But the doctrine of sin, which with some excuse is widely regarded as properly Calvinistic, and which accounts for the discredit which the whole doctrine of the primitive state and fall of man has incurred in our time, may be summarized as follows. A. In his primitive state, man was by nature disposed to righteousness, physically immortal and possessed of a highly developed intelligence. B. Adam's sin was an act of the most outrageous iniquity, and it, was not only, it not only incurred the wrath of God, but also altered his nature for the worse, making it wholly inclined to evil, and for the first time naturally subject to physical death. C. Both the personal guilt of Adam and the resulting change of nature were transmitted to Adam's offspring, so that all men are by nature hereditarily totally depraved, personally guilty from birth, subjects of divine wrath, and justly liable to everlasting punishment. D. For the exhibition of His mercy, God has unconditionally predestined particular men, without reference to foreseen response to grace on their part, to be subjects of election, of irresistible grace through Christ, of final perseverance, and of glorification. The rest He has unconditionally predestined to damnation, 
for the exhibition of his justice. Those who are of the elect cannot escape salvation, and the rest cannot secure it. E. Christ died only for the elect, who alone perceive the promised benefits of the sacraments. And finally, F. Even infants who die unregenerate are damned. And you'll see as we went through those main points of Calvinism, it's like it gets further and further away from the truth as the system goes on. And basically, Calvinism conflates concupiscence and original sin. Consider the Belgic Confession. Article 15 is about original sin. It says, quote, Original sin is a corruption of the entire nature of man and a hereditary evil which infects even infants in their mother's womb. As a root, it produces in man all sorts of sin. It is therefore so vile and abominable in the sight of God that it is sufficient to condemn the human race. It is not abolished nor eradicated even by baptism, for sin continually streams forth like water welling up from this woeful source. Now, if you come from the presupposition that original sin and concupiscence are the same thing, then I guess it would make sense to say that it's not even forgiven in baptism. But we don't see original sin and concupiscence as the same thing. Concupiscence is the result of original sin. Original sin is wiped away in baptism. Concupiscence, because it's a part of our fallen natural condition, that's why it remains. In the Catholic tradition, we call concupiscence the tender of sin. That is, it can erupt into a sinful blaze. Aquinas notes that it's not sin in itself, though it does incline us toward sin or tempt us from within. I like to think of concupiscence as sort of like when you're driving a car and the wheels are misaligned, and if you're not careful and paying attention, you'll gradually just run off the road if you don't tug that wheel back to the center. However, even though concupiscence is the tender of sin, it can equally be a tender of righteousness and virtue, in that it also is an occasion to resist sin and to grow in righteousness and virtue. Consider James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Yes, an opportunity to get through a trial or a temptation could be an opportunity to run off the road, and yet it also could be an opportunity to remain faithful and to grow in holiness. Consider James 1, verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who endures trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, concupiscence. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Article 9 in the Articles of Religion follows Paul in claiming that concupiscence has the nature of sin. But what does that mean? The term there is left undefined. How does it have the nature of sin? What is the relationship to sin? Does bare existence as a fallen creature constitute a sin? Where the evangelicals go wrong is where St. Augustine went off the rails, and sometimes attributing to Paul too literal a meaning. A parallel comparison can be made with the term children of wrath in Ephesians 2, 3. It does not mean, as Protestants claim, that before the opportunity to even commit any personal sin, infants are guilty of sin and deserving of damnation. Paul is explaining, rather, that we are all born outside of God's family, outside of His favor, without the supernatural gift of sanctifying grace and the preternatural gifts that were ours before the fall. We are offspring of a fallen family, but, of course, provision has been made for our redemption and adoption 
into God's family. Likewise, concupiscence has the nature of sin, in the sense that sin is where our appetites and impulses lead, when not guided by reason, when we have lost our integrity in our natural state to the fall. This is the nature of all vice. It's not to say that simply to exist as a fallen creature is a sin. We can see that such a definition cannot be intended in how the Anglican formularies also recognize, unlike the Calvinists, that original sin is removed by the grace of baptism. It doesn't remain. And also, with the help of God's grace, we have been given a free will and can begin to enjoy that freedom of obedience to our Heavenly Father, for which Christ set us free by His victory on the cross. Well, finally, I want to consider what are perhaps some of the unintended consequences of this Protestant view of original sin and concupiscence. We should consider for a moment past ministries to Christians who experience same-sex attraction to find lessons for the future. There were two major ministries to homosexuals from the viewpoint of faithfulness to the Christian moral tradition. One, called Exodus International, founded in 1976, became the largest and took the approach of conversion therapy, often ridiculed as pray the gay away. It saw the ultimate solution to the problem of disordered temptations as being one of bringing order back to our disordered passions. Certainly, transformation in Christ is one of the main themes of the gospel. Given the two different anthropologies, it's not surprising that this approach was predominant among evangelicals. Over time, some lost confidence in the value and outcome of conversion therapy. In 2012, the president of Exodus, Alan Chambers, remarked, quote, I do not believe that cure is a word that is applicable to really any struggle, homosexuality included. In 2013, he closed the organization with a public apology to the LGBT community saying that, quote, for some time we've been imprisoned in a worldview that neither, that's neither honoring toward our fellow human beings nor biblical. He remarked that he would seek to create safe, welcoming, and mutually transforming communities. He started a new organization with some other former Exodus leaders called Speak Love and actually came to support gay marriage, calling his former views religious homophobia. The other main approach is represented by an organization called Courage, the Roman Catholic outreach to homosexuals. Conceived by Cardinal Cook of New York as a spiritual support system, it was founded in 1980 as an apostolate of the Catholic Church that counsels men and women with same-sex attractions in living chaste lives in fellowship and truth and love. Courage does not practice conversion therapy, but rather offers counseling based on the 12-step program for addictions treatment developed by Alcoholics Anonymous. If you go to the Courage website, what you'll find are the five goals, and these were created by members themselves when Courage was founded. The goals are read at the start of each meeting, and each member is called to practice them in daily life. These are the five goals. Number one, to live chaste lives in accordance with the Roman Catholic Church's teaching on homosexuality. Number two, to dedicate our entire lives to Christ through service to others, spiritual reading, prayer, meditation, individual spiritual direction, frequent attendance at Mass, and the frequent reception of the sacraments of reconciliation and the Holy Eucharist. Number three, to foster a spirit of fellowship in which we may share with one another our thoughts and experiences and so ensure that no one will have to face the problems of homosexuality alone. Number four, to be mindful of the truth that chaste friendships are not only possible but necessary in a chaste Christian life and to encourage one another in forming and sustaining these friendships. And number five, to live lives they may ser that may serve as good examples to others. Now, equip 
and revoice and spiritual friendship seem to be following more this model of courage. But comparing those, like the trio on the Stand Firm podcast, I remain skeptical that revoice and equip and spiritual friendship are really following the courage model. It seems to be sort of leaning that direction, but not quite fully engaged. Obviously, it is the call of the church to minister to its people, helping them live lives that strive for holiness. The Dear Gay Anglican's letter stated, quote, research has demonstrated that these therapies, talking about conversion therapies, have been 96% ineffective at eliminating same-sex attraction while increasing the risk of suicide attempts by 92%. Instead, we commend churches who offer pastoral care that strengthens any Christian's spiritual health and capacity to resist temptation, knowing that the already, not yet, nature of our salvation means that many will manage enduring temptations for a lifetime. Now, I want to play a little clip from one of my favorite movies, Tombstone, when in this scene, Wyatt Earp and his family have just arrived in Tombstone, and they've come there to strike it rich, but uh, the local uh, authorities want him to sign up as the new sheriff because they know about his reputation. Let's take a look. Mr. Earp, my name's Dake, Crowley Dake, U.S. Marshal for this territory. Forget it. I'm retired. Excuse me? I said forget it. I don't want the job, and that's final. I don't think you understand. Oh, you don't understand, Marshal. I did my duty. Now I'd like to get on with my life. I'm going to Tombstone. Ah, I see. Easy on the green. Strike it rich. There you go. Well, all right, that's fine. Tell you one thing, though. Ever saw a rich man who didn't wind up with a guilty conscience? I already got a guilty conscience. Might as well have the money, too. Good day now. Well, Wyatt said it best. I already have a guilty conscience. Might as well have the money, too. Let me leave you some things to think about in this report about concupiscence. If temptation to sin is seen as sinful, why stop there? You've already got the guilt. Might as well give in. Already got a guilty conscience. Might as well have the money, too. If justification is only a forensic farce, Luther's famous snow-covered dunghill as an illustration of a saved Christian. Now, that doesn't actually literally come from Luther, but he gets pretty close to saying that in some of his examples. If justification is only a forensic farce, like a snow-covered dunghill, it damages the longing for the rewards of holiness. If there is no use in pursuing actual graces to combat temptation, then we'll stop seeking grace and stop striving after holiness. Ultimately, the concepts of accountability, virtue, and free will itself will go out the window. Well, thank you for tuning in to this Rector's Report. I welcome your thoughts and comments down below. If you are in Dallas, I invite you to come join us for worship sometime. You can look us up and learn all about us at stfrancisdallas.org. Please like and share, and we will see you there. God bless. Oh, please, oh, please, please.